Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us, God. A time in your presence, a time to worship and we praise you, God. Lord, may your name be worshipped and magnified for the word that you've spoken. Thank you so much, God. Lord, for all these young hearts that have committed to you, God, Lord, I ask that you bless them abundantly, God. Those who have renewed their relationship with you, I pray bless them, strengthen them, God. And as we sing this song, God, you reign, let that be our priority. God, let your be the one reigning over our hearts and life. And we trust our life, our plans. Uh, your, let your plans be our plans, God. Let your heart be our heart, God. In the name of Jesus, I pray and ask you. Amen. Friends, go ahead and take a seat. Um, up next, we'll have uh, the Q&A session. And uh, I think uh, brother, our, uh, brother George here, he'll dive right into the questions. He'll look over all those questions. If you guys still have any questions, uh, feel free to continue texting them. Um, we'll try to update live. Otherwise, um, whenever we're, however much time we have is how much we're going to uh, go over those questions. Uh, David, God bless you. So, George. Hey, how are you? All right, let's get right into it. Are you ready? Question number one. Shh, shh. But I don't, I don't want you talking to your neighbor, okay, please? Don't talk to your neighbor. If by the end of this um, these questions, you still have another question, follow up, then they'll flash the number on the board. There it is. Okay. So here goes. Does God have my life planned out? If so, then what do I do? How do I listen to him? That's like two or three parts to that one question. Number one, God is sovereign, which means he's king. Number two, man is free, which means God wants us to choose. So let me, div let me just give the balance. Both are true. God is sovereign, he's king, and we are free. Having said that, there are things that God chooses for us that we don't choose. I'll explain that in a minute. Then, there are things that God does not choose, he wants you to choose, okay? So, to repeat, there are things that God chooses for you, there are things you must choose for yourself. Salvation is one of those things we choose. We say, yes, we want God. God doesn't force anyone to get saved, and God doesn't send anyone to hell. People choose their eternal destiny. To me, that's black and white and very clear. Calvinists and um, people who believe in predestination, they say that God chooses some for heaven, some for hell. We don't know why. That's up to God. Then why preach the gospel? It doesn't make any sense to me. God chooses some things, but salvation is what we choose. So what are the things that God chooses? Well, did you choose where you were born? No. Did you choose your mom and dad? No, no. Can I trade my mom and dad for a better version? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not a new model? No. <laughs> Did you choose the natural color of your eyes? Yes. Natural color. Not context. <laughs> no, you did. Did you choose your height? Well, I wear heels. <laughs> no, that's not your height. That's what you're adding to your height. You didn't choose your body shape. You didn't choose your eye color. You didn't choose your genes. God chose those things. Now, God lets you choose your husband, your wife. God lets you choose your job. God lets you choose where you live. God gives you a lot of choices, okay? So there are things that God will choose, and there are things that, that we choose so I just want you to know that, okay? All right. Okay, I'm trying to X this thing out, and it's not Xing out. Can you get this back to normal here? So how do you know God's will for your life? And the answer is this, that you give your heart to God, and you say, God, lead me. God, show me. One of the things that you have to learn, and this is very important, it's easy and it's difficult. How can it be true, both of the easy and difficult? Well, when I tell you, you'll understand. It's easy to hear God's voice, but it's difficult to get yourself to be quiet to hear God's voice. Okay? The easy part is that God does speak. The hard part is for us to calm ourselves down because we are so attention deficit disordered. We're ADD. We're like, oh, 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 oh. I'm going to miss something. 
God forbid you leave your phone somewhere. Oh my goodness, I'm going to die. Somebody's going to post something. I'm not going to like it. Or I don't have enough opportunity to like it. Like, 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 like. I hope they like mine. No likes. Oh man, I better post something else. <laughs> Why are you so addicted to your phone? I, I carry my phone with me all the time. But I like to well, I read the news. I like, you know, shh, people are talking. I, I, I ask you not to talk, so be respectful. I know you're, you're like full of energy, but... So does God have my life planned out? Let me say this to you. I believe that your life is like a book. A book has a table of contents. It has chapters. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 5. Excuse me, something going on over there? Hello. Thank you. Appreciate it. Because <laughs> it's very distracting to me. A book has chapters. I do believe that God chooses some things that he wants to do in our lives. And those are chapter headings. Okay, chapter 5. I'm going to get married to someone. Well, God has a couple of candidates for us. And it's not just one person. But we get also to choose. And then when we choose that one person out of whatever potential candidates, that becomes God's will for my life. Then chapter 10. My children, you know, what kind of children will I have? Chapter 15, what part do I play in the church, in the body of Christ? These are things, some of them God chooses. God chose that I would be a preacher. God chose that I would be an evangelist. God gave me the giftings he gave me to speak to people publicly. I worked on those gifts. I got better by practicing those gifts. I went to Bible school to learn how to speak and how to read the Bible and how to get more stuff out of God. So God chooses and we choose. Both are true. Now, let me finish this question with this encouragement. In all the things that you learn to do in your Christian life, learn three things. Learn how to hear the voice of God. Number two, learn how to get life out of reading the Bible, the word of God. And number three, learn how to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he guides your life how to pray. Those are the three things I want to tell you. Let me repeat them again. Number one, learn how to hear the voice of God. You can. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Number two, learn how to read the word of God. Do you know that less than 4% of born-again Christians, we're not talking Christians all over the world, 4% of born-again Christians read the whole Bible. I'm not saying from Genesis to Revelation. I'm saying chronologically, two chapters from the Old Testament, and one from the New. There's reading plans. There's books. There's even a whole a Bible, uh, the Bible in one year. I've done this, oh, 20, 30 times in my life, really. I just finished uh, reading in December 31st, the last chapter of Revelation, chapter 22. Now I'm in Genesis again, and now I'm in Job. Because I chose the chronological. And so Genesis is the beginning of the Bible. And then Job was before Abraham. So now I'm with the book of Job. And this plan takes you to those places. If you want a really good Christian app for your uh, smartphone or your tablet, okay, or your computer, go to Olive Tree. OliveTree.com. And for like nine dollars which is not a lot of money you can download the bible you want and i think the king james is free and i think the new international is free so pick a translation that's easy to read download it on your smartphone download it on your tablet and then go for a reading plan olive tree has a reading plan once uh, through the whole bible in one year learn how to hear the voice of god learn how to read the bible get stuff out of it learn how to be filled with the holy spirit and pray those three things will answer the other questions that I have. You can do this. I learned how to do this. Now, it's a journey. It's, it's, it's a challenge, okay? Second question. 
Are our minds capable of figuring out and understanding God's will? The answer is yes. Now, I'll explain it, but the simple answer is yes. How can God expect us to do his will when we don't know what it is? So generally speaking, God's will is that you hear his voice, read his word, and you pray to him. Now, one of the best ways to know the will of God is to know when peace is in your heart. Peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. Not a piece of pie, piece of heart, <laughs> right? Because when you do the wrong thing, what's the first thing that happens to your heart, to your conscience, you do the wrong thing? Guilt. No, 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 don't, 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 unless you damaged your heart. If you didn't damage your heart, your heart is gentle and sensitive and it'll tell you. And so you are capable of knowing God's will. So God's will is that you obey his word and you be active in your church. And as you take one step of obedience, then you discover the other steps of obedience. So I can't tell you specifically, but I can tell you generally, learn how to pray, learn how to read God's word, learn how to hear his voice. And that'll take care of that question too. So number three, how do you feel when you have the Holy Spirit? How does God talk with you? Okay. There are two, Two expressions of the Holy Spirit. Two. One expression is a salvation. Second expression is when the Holy Spirit in us from salvation overflows and rivers of water come out of us. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we speak in tongues. Let me go back and say it again. There are two expressions of the Holy Spirit. One that comes with salvation, the second comes with the baptism or the overflow of God's Spirit. Without getting very deep and theological, how do we get saved? The Holy Spirit touches our heart, we know we're sinners, and we repent. We say, Jesus, forgive me my sin and come into my heart. Well, Jesus said, I'm going to my Father, but I will send you the Holy Spirit, and my presence will be with you by the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus is in our heart, it's actually his Holy Spirit that enters us. Are you listening to me? Enters us. And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. When you're a born-again Christian, you have the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean you speak in tongues and that doesn't mean you're baptized yet. That's a second expression. That's a second step. So what do I mean when I say we have the Holy Spirit at salvation? Well, the Holy Spirit changes our heart. It's called regeneration. Jesus said it this way, and you'll see the two expressions. John 7, 37. Jesus stood up on that great day of the feast and he said, if any man thirst, if anybody is thirsty for God, let him come to me. To who? To Jesus. And do what? Do what? Drink. If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So imagine in my hand a, a glass or a cup of water. I take this glass and I drink the water that's in the glass. That's called receiving Christ. That's salvation. That's repentance from sin. And when we drink of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. So let me say the verse again, and you'll see the second expression. If any man thirst, let him come to me, Jesus, and let him drink. And then he who believes, like the scripture teaches, out of his innermost being shall flow what? Rivers of water. So here you drank one cup or one glass. Let him come to me and drink. You don't drink a river. You drink a cup, a bottle. You drink. And the Holy Spirit who is in you, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a separate experience, which is a second experience, which is the overflow 
of the Holy Spirit that's already within you, he bursts forth in a river of praise, in a river of speaking in tongues. And that experience is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when you pray to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what you're really praying and you're really asking is, God, submerge me where the water is all over me. I don't want just the cup. I don't want just your presence. I want you to just overwhelm me. And like Niagara Falls, this river of living water comes out and we speak in tongues. Tongues is the prayer language of the Holy Spirit and the indication that we've received the Holy Spirit. Now, I have a question. I think it's in one of these, but I'll say it right now. When people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, when they feel the presence of God, and then they, the rivers of living water come out, and they speak in tongues, and they go home the next day, do they have doubts? And the answer is absolutely yes. Satan doesn't want you speaking in tongues. Satan doesn't want you to pray in that prayer language. You can start it and stop it whenever you want after you're baptized. You're not making things up. Holy Spirit within you is praying, but it's under your control. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, the Spirit is subject under the control of the speaker. And you could quiet it down. You could start it up. That's why in a concert of prayer, we pray in tongues. Then everybody quiets it down. The Holy Spirit prays in us, through us, but we start it and stop it because it's under our ability to control in terms of when and how and how long. So the enemy will give you doubts. Doubts is the attack of the enemy. Okay, there's one really good way to battle doubts, but you have to learn how to put on the armor of God. Have you ever heard of the armor of God? Yes? It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. My children are not children anymore. My son is 36. My second son is 34. My daughter just turned 32. Okay? 31, I think. And since they were little children, as long as they could say, speak, every morning we would pray and we would put on the armor of God. Now, there are seven pieces to the armor of God. Four of them are defensive and two are offensive. Here they go. And in Ephesians chapter 6, it doesn't give them an order. But for me to remember them, I go from my top of my head to my feet and out to the sides. And that's just easier for me to remember. Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. I put on my head the helmet of salvation. It covers our thoughts. I put on my heart the breastplate of righteousness. That's not my righteousness. That's God's righteousness. I put on my waist the belt of truth. I don't lie. I don't exaggerate. I speak the truth. I put on my feet the sandals or the shoes, if you want to call them, of peace. Right? Right? The sandals of peace. Then I lift up the shield of faith in order to what? To quench or to stop the fiery darts of the wicked one. Because in your Christian life, you're praising God. Satan says, you're not a Christian. Put those hands down. Why are you praising? You're such a hypocrite. Remember you yelled at your mom the other day. Remember you did this. Remember you said that. Remember you were there. you stinking. Put your hands down. Darts, 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 darts. And they're fiery. There is a spiritual battle going on. Right in this room, there's angels. And right in this room, there are evil spirits. That are like, Don't listen. That's, that's not for you. That'll never happen. You're not spiritual. Come on. You want to go out with the guys and mess around. Ah, uh, that you know, you have your clique of girls hanging. Nah, don't listen to that. Those are all darts of the evil one. Lift up the shield of faith and you guard against the darts. Some will get by and hurt you, but a shield is a shield, right? So helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, sandals of peace, shield of faith to quench the fiery darts. And we hold in our hand the what? 
sword of the spirit. The word of God. Don't just shield, attack. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, blood of Jesus, the word of God says, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus used the sword of the spirit. And the seventh weapon is praying at all times in the spirit. When I drive my car, I pray in tongues. When I prepare for this morning, I was praying in tongues. While we were worshiping, I was singing a little bit and singing in tongues. Praying in the spirit builds not your brain, but your spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I will pray in a language I understand, English for you, and I will pray in the spirit and my mind is not fruitful. I don't know what I'm saying in tongues, but my spirit is built up. The book of Jude only has one chapter, and it says you building yourselves up in your most holy faith by praying in the spirit. So let me go back to the three things I'm telling you. Learn how to hear God's voice. Learn how to read the word of God and get something from it and be filled with the Holy Spirit and pray every day. Pray in English, and then you run out of things to ask for, and then pray in tongues. And you know the funny thing about praying in tongues? Not funny, haha, but funny, interesting, funny, cool, funny, good. The interesting thing about praying in tongues is the more you do it, the easier it is. And the more it's like just part of you, and your spiritual life will be strong. You know, John the Baptist, he was mighty in spirit mighty we're talking about you know being buff spirits are being strong in the lord how do you fix your relationship with christ if it's broken repent and surrender repent lord i'm sorry lord forgive me repent and believe how do you receive freedom from sin well it's not just one magic abac abracadabra. Do this one, two, three, and you're free from sin. It's not easy. If you read Romans 6, 7, and 8, those are the chapters that tell you about struggling with sin. Romans 6, 7, and 8. Romans 6 says, man, I have a battle. Romans 7 says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Who will free me? And the last verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. And Romans 8 gives the answer. That if I live by the Spirit, I do less of the things of the flesh. So Romans 6, 7, and 8 will answer that question better than I can do that right now. Friends influence me to get farther from God. It's hard for me to say no. How do I fight this battle? Okay, sounds to me that you still want to be with friends who influence you to sin. Are those the kind of guys you want to hang out with? Are those the kind of girls you want to be with? You have to make a choice to follow Christ, and that means losing some friends that are bad for you. Bad friends will ruin good morals, says the word of God. So you got to choose. Oh, but I won't have any friends. That's not true. God will raise up more encouraging friends if you are looking for friends who will help you walk the Christian life. See, we all want to be popular. We want to all be one of the guys or one of the girls. But not if you compromise. So if your friends are, are, are influencing you to do bad stuff, like smoke weed or, or steal stuff or watch porn, what kind of friends are those? You're not going to be follow Christ. You're going to follow your friends to hell. Is that what you, you want to do? <laughs> but we're together. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> hell is a place of separation. Oh, my. So your friends will lead you there, and then they're one, one burning part. You're another burning part. <laughs> How do you see God with a pure heart? I don't know what that question is asking. How do you see God is easy to answer. Are you saying that you have to have a pure heart before you seek God? It doesn't happen that way. The only way our hearts are pure is first we come to God. First we seek him, and then God purifies our hearts. You can't fix yourself, then come to God. You can't make yourself a better person so that God will respect you, and then he answers your prayer. 
You come to God as a sinner who's sorry for his sin. That crowd over there is kind of like goofing around and listening. Shh, hey, guys, do you want me standing here wasting my time? Or are you going to listen? I mean, I could, I could go now and you guys could have your little discussion. So be respectful for the next 20 minutes. People are asking questions, and if it's not interesting to you, well, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it on your level, but you got to show respect. All right. Where's the line between disobeying your parents and making decisions for your own life? Don't raise your hands, but how many of you have parents who say, no, you can't do that? And you're like, Arr. no, you can't go there. Why? <laughs> My dad is too strict. <laughs> hey, listen, we've all been there. Okay, let's go from 12 to 18. That's a six-year span. 12, you're preteen, and you become a teenager at 13. And at 18, you're legally considered an adult. If you are living in your parents' house, you are under your parents' authority. Now, Slavic parents are more strict, I think, in some ways than American parents. Is that a good thing? I think so. But let's not argue that. They just are stricter. So how do we answer this question? How much do you obey your parents from 12 to 18? And how much do you make your own decisions? Now, let me turn the question around and answer as a parent, okay? I, George, and my wife, Esti, David Duke, we decided that from 12 to 18, we're going to ask our children to do certain things because we choose them, but we want to teach them how to make decisions. We want to teach them how to handle freedom. We want to slowly give the decision-making of their life from us to them because at 18, they're going to go either to college or 19 and start living life and making choices. And 12 to 18 is the preparation for that. So it has to go from parents make all the decisions to 18. Now the young man and young lady in the house is required to make those decisions and they're going to affect the rest of your life. I don't believe that as a parent, Slavic or not Slavic, our job is to cut our children's wings because there are parrots who will fly away. And so the owners of the parents, they clip, it doesn't hurt, but it just clips the ends of the wings and the bird can't fly. They can walk, they can flutter, but they can't get off the ground. But if you don't cut them, they're going to grow out again and they're going to fly away. And so Slavic parents, American parents, they think, okay, I want my kids to be with me forever. And then they're going to live with me and pay my mortgage. So they're going to clip their wings and tie them to the fartushka, to the apron. <laughs> but that's not the right way for a parent to think. The right way to raise a child is, I want to prepare you for a very evil world. And I want to teach you what's right and teach you what's wrong. Because you're going to have to make the decision when you marry, when you go to way to school, when you do A, B, or C, or D. So that's my perspective as a parent. Now, as a child, 12 to 18, living in my mom and dad's house, my dad was a pastor, I had to be in church. So when I was 12, I had no choice. I had to be in church. Okay, it uh, went out. Uh, and so, whatchamacallit, um, but when I was 14, I took water baptism. When I was 15, I was singing with other people. When I was 16, we were traveling on a mission trip. And so I discovered that my dad's prayers for me helped me to make my own choices. And as I began to have freedom, I began to do the things that God wanted me to do. And I got more freedom from that. So if you're 12 to 18 or more, I want to say this to you. Life is about making right decisions. And now is the time you've got to learn how to do that. Because you're not going to be a little baby anymore. 
you're going to be a young man, you're going to be a young lady, and you're get married whenever it is, 18, 20, 24, 26, okay? All right. How do you know if the guy or the girl is the right one? Girls love this question. <laughs> young people in a youth conference like this from many churches, they're like submarines with periscopes. Did you know that? <laughs> they're like, and they're, okay, is he here? Is he here? Oh, there he is. Oh, what a cutie. <laughs> and the guys are like, is she here? Oh, there's potential. <laughs> Listen, that's normal. I did that. You do that. We know this, right? Now, there's something. This is not biblical. This is just, just, this is just human, not biblical, human. Have you ever heard of puppy love? Puppy love? Where like a little puppy, oh, there's a cute puppy, come here, let me cuddle you, oh, yeah, puppy love. That's not true love. That's just like a little kitty kind of love, puppy love. But let's talk about the real question. Let's say you're of the age to marry. That's going to be way above 18, 19, 20, and up. You're at the age to marry, right? So how do you know that boy, that girl is the one? I do believe that God has more than one because if that one is not obedient, God has another person just as good, okay? But let's go back to the most important decision in your life. Let's talk about the two most important decisions in your life. So what's the number one important decision in your life, to serve Jesus or not? Correct? Would you agree with me? Number one decision in your life, do I serve God or not? Now, how did we make that number one decision? Or better, maybe put it like this question, how did I know that I had to give my life to Jesus? How did you know that Jesus was the one for your life? Well, you may say, well, there's only one and there are many girls or many guys. I get it, I get it. But that's not the point. The point is, how did you know there's a God? You don't see him. How did you know that he had to come into your heart? It's not that people told you. People did tell you. But my point is this. You knew. You knew that you knew that you knew I have to give my life to Christ. And you did. And you did. You, you're looking back and you were saying, I'm glad I did. Such and such a time in my life, I received water baptism. Such and such a time, Jesus became very serious in my life for me. If it is true that for the number one decision in your life, you know that you know that Christ is in your heart. I also believe the number two decision, most important in your life after number one, is do you marry or do you not marry? And how do you know which one of those young ladies for guys, which one of those young men for young ladies is the right guy or girl? And the answer is, you will know. See, I also believe, and I, I prayed this. I said, God, I'm afraid to miss that person. Can you bring me to her or can you bring her to me? You see, when Adam was by himself, the Lord said, it's not good. And so the Lord put a deep sleep on Adam. And he said, Adam, you fall asleep. Leave this to me. While Adam was sleeping, he made a woman. Let's not talk about the process. Let's talk about what happened when Adam opened his eyes. You know his first words? It's not in the Bible, but I know what he said. When Adam opened his eyes and he saw beautiful Eve, his first words were, Mamma mia. <laughs> I'm almost positive. She was beautiful. She was attractive. Something in his heart said, she's the one. Okay? So I said to God, I said, God, Adam didn't have to go anywhere. You brought her to him or brought him to her. The second example I said to God, I said, when the son of promise, Isaac, he wanted to find a bride for his wife, Rebecca. God worked it out that Isaac was in the field reading the word of God. 
meditating on the scriptures. He raised his eyes, his periscope, <laughs> and there she was climbing off a camel. And he loved her for love at first sight. Isn't that interesting? She lived in another country, but God brought her to him while he was reading the word of God and thinking and meditating on it. So that's two examples I said to God. I said, God, I don't want to date and I don't want to miss this girl. I don't know where she is, but can you lead me to her or can you lead her to me while I sleep, while I just relax? And that's what happened in my life. I met my wife when she was 11 years old, but I didn't know she would be my wife. She was a little girl in a nice family. I gave her a piggyback ride. <laughs> True story, like Skaska, like a fairy tale. I was 16 years old. We're five years difference. I was six foot three. I was singing. I was preaching. I went to Canada. I watched her grow up. And when I was uh, 21 and she was 16, I said, whoa, that's a nice young looking young lady. But nothing. I wasn't ready for marriage. Neither was she. She was only 16. This was in Canada. She lives on a map, okay? So right where the question mark is, is New Jersey, okay? Right where the, the second mountain from the left is, that's Canada. And right up to the top of the blue screen, that's where she lived. And God brings me from the question mark after one up to the top to Toronto, to Winnipeg, to Swan River, to Saskatchewan, to Edmonton, and up in Edmonton at the top of the screen is Alberta, Canada. And she's 21 and I'm 26. And I fell in love with this girl that I knew as a little young lady in a beautiful family. And I asked her to marry me. By the way, I was, um, the, the thing got dark again. Uh, by the way, I was reading the word of God when she came and she said, can I talk to you? And she was shelling some peas on the farm. And I was reading the word of God for the service. So it's funny. I started laughing. I said, God, you're just, you're so funny. <laughs> just like Isaac is in the field meditating on the word of God. And she came. That's exactly how it happened. Now, it's not going to happen to you that way, okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you. How do you find out that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know? Tell me another question. What's another question? Technology is great when it works, isn't it? Oy Boże, treba uczki. I am a growing preacher. I read the Bible and pray every day. I don't feel the connection of Jesus. Okay. One of two things are happening. Either you live by your emotions and you don't feel that emotional presence of Jesus. It's not an emotional thing. It's an inside connection that you have a relationship that's a daily connecting. When I read the word of God, I talk to God when I read it. And I feel his presence. He doesn't always say something to me. You cannot make God speak to you. But if you're listening, God will say something. That's the difference. And the connection is not doing religious activity. The connection is abiding. What does it mean to abide? Okay, you know what the word is today? You don't know what the word abide means, but you know what the word hang out is, right? Do you hang out with your friends? Yeah, you do. What do you do? I'm hanging. I'm hanging. No, 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 no. There's no ropes involved. It's just kind of, we're spending time together. Oh, oh, oh. So why do you say you're hanging yourself? But when you hang with somebody, you don't have a schedule. Okay, now let's do this. <laughs> and after that, we will do that. <laughs> no, you just chill. Oh, oh, tamzim, no. <laughs> no, it's no. Some of, you, some of you didn't get that joke. <laughs> so chili it us? No. I think that a connection is just in his presence. You, you really chill. You hang. You have a, a relationship. It's hard for me to understand the question because I never experienced that. After baptism, what are some advice or tips for staying connected with God? 
get plugged in to a youth group, number one, get plugged into Bible reading, number two, get plugged in to an activity where you do stuff together with other Christians who are on fire for God. Don't hang out with Christians that are dead because you will be dead. <laughs> okay? What do I do when I lose hope in praying for something for a long time? Why do you lose hope? You see, there are prayers that I've prayed that God hasn't answered yet. So I'm not going to convince God to do something that is not good for him to do that I don't know. So I give it to God. Now, when I pray for people, I still pray for them. I've prayed for people that still haven't come to God. I've been praying 15 years for somebody who still hasn't made a commitment. But God has touched their life again and again, and they're being stubborn about it, but I'm still praying. By the way, it's good to have a short list of people, five or ten, that you pray for. When you were praying your groups, I prayed for the people on my prayer list, and I prayed to God by name. And you know, I see God doing stuff. I see God doing stuff. Okay? So don't, don't lose hope. It takes years and years sometimes, but don't stop praying. One babushka prayed 15 years for a village. And finally, after 15 years, God heard her prayer. How do I worship God in church if I don't feel his presence? Okay, there's feeling his presence emotionally, and there's feeling his presence spiritually. Funny thing happened to me last Sunday. Last Sunday, I was home in Sprinkle, Missouri. I went to an American church, and the first song was something about I, I, I feel, I don't feel, I have, I don't have, I, I. I couldn't connect with that song. So I stood there. I'm like, wow, it's hard for me to worship. I, I don't get it. But see, that worship song was about people, not about God. The second song started with the words, all hail King Jesus. All give him glory. My hands went like, whoo. I felt like murashki, like ants crawling up and down. I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, wow, we're worshiping God, not people. Not our feelings, I feel. Whoa. So sometimes that happens when you have a worship song that's not worshiping God. And you don't connect with that. But when it's a worship of God. You know, at the end of the day, you have to have some kind of connection with God. If you don't have a connection with God, then you're just doing religious activities. You're just kind of like not faking it, but trying to make it happen and it's not happening but, but with God it doesn't work that way when you love somebody and they love you back you don't have to say a lot of stuff you don't have to do a lot of stuff there's a connection and so I don't know how to tell you that why does God give us a choice if he already knows what is going to happen why is that a problem for you or me If you are a super, super intelligent, smartest kid in the class, smartest kid in the school, smartest kid in the town, smartest kid in America, and a little boy is going to do A or B, and you say, I know what he's going to do, and he does what you already knew he's going to do, does that hinder his free choice, or does that just speak about how intelligent you are, right? No, it doesn't hinder his choice because he's going to choose without you. But you already saw where he's leaning, he's, you know, intending to go. And that's with God. God sees what we do. God knows what we will choose. But he doesn't force our choice. Here, I, I don't like to get into really heavy, deep thoughts. But you know what? You're pretty smart. I'm going to give you a very difficult concept of time. Einstein said there are not three dimensions, there are four. See, one dimension is up and down, like a helicopter. One dimension is back and forth, like a car. And one dimension is left and right on, on the road, okay? So here are three dimensions, up and down, back and forth, left and right. Those are the three axes, the dimensions. But Einstein said, no, there's a fourth. And we don't see it, but we live in it. 
Einstein, what is that fourth dimension? Time. What do you mean time? Well, he gave lots of examples. He gave example of a train. You're standing on the platform. You see one thing. You're on the train. You see another thing. Okay? I'll give you another example. Have you ever seen a parade either on television or actual parade on the sidewalk from the sidewalk, right? Okay. Imagine a parade. A parade has a beginning. That's the person with the baton. They're leading the parade. Behind him are brass band. Right? Drums, horns, and then whatever. Uh, people following. Parades, cars with flowers, people waving, all, all kinds of stuff. Parade has a middle. And so when you are standing on the sidewalk, you're watching the parade walk before you. Okay, here's the beginning of the parade. Okay, now the main guy is gone. Now I'm watching the middle of the parade. Okay, they're gone. And then come the horses and people waving and they're gone. And then behind the horses is the guy sweeping behind the horses. <laughs> or shoveling <laughs> into the garbage can. And the parade went by. Right? Did you, you understand what I said? I saw the beginning. I'm enjoying the middle. And finally the parade passed me by. But if I got in a helicopter high up enough where I see the whole town, I see the street on which the parade is going. It's a long parade. And I could see the whole parade all at once. I see the beginning of the parade. I see the middle of the parade. I see the horses and the guys with the broom and shovel at the end of the parade. All at the same time. You see, God is above time. Time for you and me has a progression. We live in now. Yesterday or an hour ago is gone and never to return. Tomorrow still did not come. It's only 233 it's not five o'clock yet. Five o'clock is not here. So we live on the sidewalk, in the parade, in time. But God is greater and above time. And he sees all the things that will happen, have happened, and are yet to happen. That's why the book of Revelation was written. It's going to happen exactly the way God showed John. John took, excuse me, Jesus took John to the third heaven. He said, John, come up here. I want to show you something. And John is trying to describe with first century words what he saw in the 21st century. I saw a candle with the fire streaking through the sky. He saw a rocket. He doesn't know what a rocket is. I saw a torch burning i saw something hit the river and everything in the river turned bitter and its name was wormwood you know what the russian word for wormwood is chernobyl <laughs> you know what chernobyl means it's a kind of a wood called wormwood chernobyl is in the new in the, in the in the book of revelation crazy so it didn't happen yet but god took john and showed him the parade that will be, that will pass by in the 21st century. All right, I, let's go to something more simple. <laughs> Why does God let us do things that hurt us when he knows that will hurt us? Okay, when you have a little child and you have a hot stove, you say to the child, don't touch, it's hot. And the little child is like... And you tell them, you tell them, you tell them. Sometimes telling them doesn't work. Okay, go ahead, touch it. Ah, why did you let me touch it? Because you wanted to. <laughs> the better Buddhist? No. <laughs> That's the answer, okay? Simple answer. <laughs> if God forgave us, will, what will he judge us with on Judgment Day? I love this question. Listen to this. There are two judgments. One for sin and one for rewards. <laughs> now, the one for sin is the last judgment. This great white throne judgment. John says in chapter 20, I saw the dead, great and small, they st and the books were open, and they were judged according to the books, whatever they did. And those whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of fire, they were thrown, Lamb's book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. That's the bad judgment. 
sin will be judged. But you and I go to the judgment of rewards because Jesus took the judgment for our sins. Do you know what Jesus did? He took away all. Did he take 99% of our sins or all of them? Are you sure? How maybe there's one sin he'll, he'll make you pay for? No. All, all is all. And see, when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. When God looks at you, he sees white clothes without spot or wrinkle. That's the beauty of being a Christian, that even though we struggle, and the Bible says, blessed are those who wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Do you know that repentance should be daily? Do you know that uh, for forgiveness should be daily? Now, I love this question. What if you die unexpectedly and you don't ask forgiveness? Okay, so, you know, somebody steps on your toe and you, you give a curse word. Ah, well, whatever. <laughs> and a bus hits you and you die. Do You go to heaven you go to hell heaven and you know why because there are levels of choice let me explain the highest level of choice is ultimate do i serve god do i not once we make that choice i give my life to you he sanctifies us instantly and immediately we are then written in the lamb's book of life but George, we sin every day. This is true. But God doesn't erase our name, then write it again. Then erase our name and write it again. I mean, he's going to tear through the paper with all the sins that we do. His eraser will be rubbed out. God doesn't do that. So what God does, he measures our sin on what level is it. And if our heart's desire is to serve God, is there any Christian who's perfect, who never sins after that? No. So let me give you the scripture. John chapter, oh, 1 John chapter 1 says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, his blood forgives us from all sins. To walk in the light means, Lord, I'm going to come back to the word of God. Lord, I'm going to repent, okay? And he's going to forgive your sins. But if I walk in darkness, which I don't repent, then your sin will keep you from heaven. But walking is constant, right? He who is born again does not make a practice of sinning where you want to live a lifestyle, right? Like if you're sleeping with your girlfriend and, 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 and living in sin, oh, I'm going to heaven. No, you're not. <laughs> you need to repent of your sin and then you'll go to heaven. Then there are sins of, of, of our choices. Then there are sins of every day. And they are the sins that we don't mean. They're the sins of our words, the sins of our actions. But they're a daily small sin. Those are all covered by the blood because we've not changed the main sin. I'm not saying so we would sin. Um, uh, Paul says uh, that grace is greater than our sins. So what shall we say then? Shall I sin that God's grace is greater? No, God forbid. And it says, do not use your grace as an occasion of the flesh. If I have bad thoughts, is there a way I could get rid of them? Yes. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5. I have memorized these two verses. It is a mind cleaner, like a vacuum. It is like bleach. It is like Lysol. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. I can quote it for you. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down vain imaginations, that's bad thoughts, and bringing every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Every time I get a lustful thought, every time I get a prideful thought, every time I get an angry thought, I catch myself and I quote this verse and I say, Satan, my mind will not be a nest for your evil thoughts. Okay. Now, is jumping and clapping okay in worship? Don't ask me for permission to jump or to clap. We live in a culture. Our church has practices and has a church culture. 
Slavic people don't clap and they don't jump. That's just part of their culture. Most Americans don't clap and jump either, although some do. So now charismatic churches, they felt so free that they love clapping and they love jumping. I don't have a problem if they want to jump or if they want to clap, but I don't do that. Now, when I was a little boy, um, you see other churches and our culture affect our churches. I wasn't born in the Soviet Union. I was born in America, and American churches clapped, but they did it in a nice way, just clap. You know, this is the day, so I clapped. And my church and my dad, we never had a problem with clapping. I found out that Slavic Christians had a problem. No, but it's scriptural. The Old Testament, it says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph, right? It's not a charismatic practice. It's a biblical practice. But Slavics don't practice it and they don't like it. So don't do it. You know, you're respecting your culture. So that's the wrong question. Is it okay? What, you want me to say, go to your church, start clapping, and everybody's like glaring at you? <laughs> Why is it that demons are more unified and co cooperate better than most of our churches? Oh, yeah? Do you hang, enough, hang out with demons to know that they're kind of like each other and hang out together? Like, where are you hanging out, bro? <laughs> First of all, demons do not cooperate. Demons hate God, hate each other. And demons are angry, bitter, and very um, resentful. And they want people to be the same way. You see, it's unfortunate, but people can be influenced by demonic spirits. And I hate church splits, and I hate church fighting, and God hates it. Those people that split churches, those people who fight in churches, they will have a greater punishment than people who don't go to church. People who don't go to church will have a punishment. But Christians who fight, curse, bring each other to court, they're going to be greater judged. Trust me. Demons are not more unified. <laughs> Do I still have to ask forgiveness every time I pray, even though I know God, I know God took all my sins? First of all, we never can remember all of our sins. Because if you committed a million sins, how many sins do you confess? Three, five. <laughs> and the rest are covered. You confess what the Holy Spirit brings to your mind. Get it out of the way. Confession, repentance should not be ours and, and like, in, like encyclopedia. Deal with it quickly and you move on. Why is it? No. How do we defeat the spirit of rebellion? And how do we put restrictions on ourselves? I imagine you're talking about the spirit of rebellion in your own heart. <laughs> Listen, learn how to give up your rights. That means to deny yourself and take up the cross. That's a very mature thing to learn how to do. How do we put restrictions on ourselves? Listen, it sounds like you're trying to force yourself to do the will of God. Don't do that. Say, Holy Spirit... Give me grace that I could willingly do things. The grace of God is better than restrictions of law. Can evil spirits enter a room or place shielded by angels? That's a question I don't know. But I will say this. That when you ask God's angels to fight for you, they will come. When you plead the blood of Jesus, demons will flee. When your heart is clean, you have authority over the enemy. That's clear. What happens in the spirit world, I can't tell you because I don't see it. I don't know it. But I know this, that before I went to Bible school, I was afraid of the dark. Before I learned about the authority of the, of the believer, I was scared of demons. I, I, I thought that demons are more powerful than us. And when I went to Bible school, I learned James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right. I'll take one question from the audience if there's somebody brave enough to ask me a question on anything I said today. And I think I'm done for today. Is there a question? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Can guys and girls be friends? Define the word friends.
It's possible, but it's rare. It's like hen's teeth. You ever see a chicken with teeth? <laughs> it's rare. Why is it rare? Because one of the two will fall in love. One of the two will start having more emotions. Am I right? Let's say the guy is cool with being friends. And the girl is like, oh, maybe I can change his mind. <laughs> or vice versa. What if the girl says, look, I'm... I'm not attracted to you, but if you want to hang out and pay for my Starbucks, you can. <laughs> so, and then he's thinking, maybe I could still work on her. You know what? Can I say this, not just to you, but I think you asked the question for everybody. Let's be honest with ourselves. How many of us think we could fool God by pretending we don't like somebody but we really like pretending that here let me give you an example in bible school god said no dating no relationship nothing but there was this cute blonde girl and i was sitting by her god said what are you doing nothing <laughs> i'm opening the door for her god said what are you doing i'm opening the door she has to go through the door <laughs> i never kissed her never held her hand i never said ugly things never said romantic things but i like her she is really cute God says to me, didn't I tell you to not focus on girls but me? God, I'm, I'm fine. I'm behaving. It's like God is stupid and we're smart. Like, come on, get real, right? So that's my answer to you. God is not stupid. He sees like x-ray vision through your heart motives or his or hers. So stop playing games with God. Because you're only fooling yourself. Wow, George, that was good. <laughs> One more question. I'm, I'm generous here today. Oh, I see a hand there. One in the back. Yeah. Um, are thoughts sinful? Are thoughts sinful? No. Billy Graham said, you can't stop a blackbird from landing on your head but you can stop a blackbird from building a nest in your head. You're going to be tempted. Some guy is really cute. You're like, oh, wow, I wish, you know, da, da, da. And, God, and you catch yourself. No, I can't go there. Well, you didn't sin because you caught yourself, okay? Well, I, I've been at the communion table praying over the wine and bread, and Satan comes and gives me this horrible thought. I say, in Jesus' name, get out of here. Because I recognize it as an attack of the enemy in a time of great holiness and a time of dedication and, and, and. So can you now how do you sin with your thoughts is that you not only welcome that thought you let it build a nest and then you fantasize now women do this better than men but men fantasize as well women have a greater imagination in some ways and then you play with the thought, what will it be like to sleep with that guy or girl? What will it be like? And then you, you, you paint the picture. That's sinful. That is wrong. That is entertaining sin. Come into my living room and make me feel turned on or make me feel a certain way that I want to feel. And that, that is sin. That is sin. Don't allow... Don't give permission. Let me put it that way. Don't give permission for sin to find a place in your thought life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. I'm generous. One more question. One more question. If you want. If not, yes. Okay. Okay. Now, now you say okay. Well, that's a good question. In other words, the question is, when a Christian dies, where does he go? Is that the question? And a non-Christian dies, where does he go, right? Okay. Let me tell you really quick. This is interesting. Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story about a, 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 a leper called Lazarus. This is not the brother of Mary and Martha. This is a different Lazarus because this one had leprosy. The other one didn't have leprosy. 
Secondly, there's a rich man. We don't know his name. But we know it's not a parable. Jesus never gave names in a parable. Luke 16. So, Lazarus is hungry and sick and dying. He's on the front step of the rich man's house. And the rich man is so selfish, he steps over his sick body of the poor leper. And he goes in his life. Now, Jesus says both die. I don't know if they die at the same time or separately or at different intervals. But now both have died. Before the resurrection of Jesus, listen carefully. This could be confusing. Before the resurrection of Jesus, everyone who died, their spirit and their soul went into a place called Sheol in Hebrew. Greek, it's Hades. Okay? Hades. Sheol is the Hebrew. Hades is the Greek. It was divided in two sections with a great chasm that you could not cross over. One section was for the evil dead and one section was for the righteous dead. So when the rich man died and Lazarus the poor leper died, they went to those two places. The rich man found himself in hell in unrighteous Sheol, that division, that section. He was in torment, but he had memory. He had recognition. He could feel pain. He had consciousness. And he was aware, right? The same thing, right? consciousness. He looks over the chasm. He sees Father Abraham. And he also sees the leper who was sick on his doorstep, Lazarus. And he shouts out to Lazarus, Lazarus, oh, Father Abraham, give permission to Lazarus to somehow make it here to where I am. Let him dip his finger in water and let a drop of water be on my parched tongue. He was in so much torment. Father Abraham answers, that's not possible for there is a great division between these two sections. Then the rich man says, let him send his, then send Lazarus to my five brothers that they don't come to this place of evil. And Father Abraham said, that's not possible either. They have the scriptures. And then the rich man says, no, they won't read the scriptures. And then Abraham says, if they don't believe the scriptures, sorry, I can't take your call. <laughs> they won't believe even if someone to arise from the dead, which Jesus did. When Jesus died on the cross, his body was put in a tomb. Our bodies were put in the graves and they decay, they decompose. The atoms, energy is never lost. It's just changed. So from dust, we go to dust. Jesus went into Sheol, says Peter and says Jude. And he announced liberation. And he took the section of the righteous dead and he emptied that whole section and took them to heaven with him into paradise. It's called paradise. Now, the Bible tells us in Revelation 20 and 21 that there is a city that is being prepared and has been prepared by Jesus. I go to prepare a place, and that's called the New Jerusalem. And that's not going to be the entire heaven. That's only the capital city of heaven, and heaven will be the rest of the presence of God and his angels. And now today, if an evil person dies, he goes, his spirit and his soul goes into hell, Sheol, as a waiting place. They stay there until the final resurrection. And then they are resurrected to be judged on the great white throne judgment. And when the books are open, if their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, which it's not, 
Then they're cast into the final place called the lake of fire. The lake of fire is not Sheol. The lake of fire is eternity separated from Christ. Christians who die, if I were to die today, my body would fall dead on this stage and you would bury it or my wife would bury it, right, in a grave. But my spirit and soul go right into the presence of God. Okay? All right, thank you very much. I'm dead. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Pastor.